Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. As always, Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I are joined by Riley Caps. Riley is the editorial director at Healing Maps, an organization and website that helps people find access to psychedelic treatments and retreats. Riley has written about psychedelics for the Washington Post, the Telluride Daily Planet, Lucid News, 5280, Shakruna, The Third Wave, and the Maps Bulletin. His reporting for Rooster, a Colorado magazine, helped catalyze the world's first psychedelic decriminalization vote in Denver in 2019. Riley is also a recent graduate of the Numinous Fundamentals of Psychedelic Assisted Therapy course. Today we talk about his experience in that course, what good psychedelic training looks like generally, the pros and cons of the interdirected approach to psychedelic therapy, what it means to have a therapeutic lineage, various ways psychedelic tools could be used both inside and outside the traditional mental health clinic model, Riley's experience with embodied inquiry, and much, much more. Folks, if you hear Riley describe his experience in our Fundamentals of Psychedelic Assisted Therapy course and you think, you know what, I I, I would love to get me some of that, please follow the link in our show notes or go directly to numinous.com forward slash hour dash training dash selection and use the code PTF10 for 10% off selected trainings. You hear Reed and I talk a lot about the psychedelic clinical trial work that Numinous does If you or someone you know might be interested in being a participant in a psychedelic clinical trial, you can click on the link in the show notes or go directly to numinous.com forward slash research to learn more about the trials we're currently running. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by leaving us a rating or review in places like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, you can like the video, subscribe to the channel, and if you would be so kind, please share this episode with somebody you think might benefit from it. Without further ado, here's our conversation with Riley Caps. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Reed and I are pleased to be joined today by Riley Caps. Welcome, Riley. Hi, Steve. Hi, Reed. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Um, give us, Give them some perspective on who you are. So I wear a lot of hats. I'm a reporter, mostly about psychedelics, written for the Washington Post, Double Blind, Rooster Magazine. Uh, I'm an EMT that uh, used to be on the ambulance in Boulder answering 911 calls. And I became an EMT to be helpful in psychedelic ceremonies. And I'm the editorial director of Healing Maps. Healing Maps is a directory of ketamine clinics and psilocybin retreats. So I do a lot of different things, but most of them revolve around psychedelics in one way or another. And then I organize the local Denver community in various ways Mm -hmm. we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of my immediate curiosities is um, how you feel like being an EMT prepared you for sitting with others in psychedelic ceremony. Yeah, it was. So I became an EMT so I could be good in ayahuasca circles. I used to drink with this circle and they always had an EMT there Cool. and it always brought me a lot of comfort. You know, this was 15 years ago. I wasn't very experienced and I would think I was dying. I would think I was going crazy. I would think that I was not there anymore. And then I would crack an eye open and I would see the EMT across the room Mm -hmm. sitting there quietly, comfortably looking at me and I would think, okay, I'm probably not going to die. And then I would be able to go back inside. So I got a job in the ambulance and the ambulance is like an incredibly intense experience at times where people are possibly going to die. People are sometimes off their rockers. Sometimes they are bleeding out. You know, you have to get into the hospital. And so it's some of the same skills where you're just trying to think of the right thing to do or the best thing to do and um, be present, you know, just like, Sometimes you can't fix people, and sometimes the best thing you can do is just sort of sit there and be that calm presence for them. And yeah. so I think that's similar to to a psychedelic sitter. There's nothing like a good space holder. Sounds like the EMTs were a special kind of safe anchor for you. And yeah, that's that's pretty neat. And how did you get into um, working with ayahuasca 15 years ago? That date, dates back a while. I'm curious how how you got initially introduced to this world? Uh, randomly, I was 
dating a Shipibo woman. And this was just in Colorado. She had immigrated here and she told me about this medicine that her grandmother had done, that her mother had used when she was 12 years old for healing of stomach troubles. And I said, well, that's interesting. And I had already done some mushrooms and a few things. And, but that just kickstarted my deep interest. And then I found a circle here in Colorado that I started sitting with. Cool. Cool. That's amazing. Um, and this is a totally unfair question, but what have you learned from ayahuasca? <laughs> if, if you have anything that comes to mind, uh, I just like to throw that out there now and then. Yeah, I learned a lot. Um, mostly that the world is bigger than I thought it was. And that my problems are smaller than I thought they were. So mm -hmm. Those are the two. And that there's just way more out there. There's some something's bigger out there perspective we were saying the other day on this podcast that you know one way i like to think about this idea of enlightenment that uh you know we we also you know shy away from or view as this state we can touch into but not don't pretend to always be there but it's this radical change of perspective or flipping the lights on sounds like uh the way you describe seeing your problems and seeing kind of yourself in these new ways. It sounds like that, like a light switch or um, whether it's in one awakening or many along the way of like just seeing things in perspective, you know? Yeah. In a perspective that you didn't, that I didn't know was there, you know, I thought I could look at my problems from 10 feet above or 10 feet below or 10 feet to the side. And ayahuasca was like, you can see things from a million miles away. And you can see your problems from super deep inside of yourself. And I didn't know that was possible. Like, I just, the, the places that it takes you are just, I didn't know they were there. And, you know, it was, it's just a crazy, it's a crazy thing. It's a crazy experience. You guys have been there. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what's on the menu um, when you're not aware of the menu, right? <laughs> it's and it's why it can be so challenging to answer a question like Reed's, and I love the way he, he posed it, because it's like, you know, trying to describe a psychedelic experience or a non-ordinary state of consciousness is, is like trying to describe a dream to somebody, trying to describe what salt tastes like, trying to describe what colors are to people who've never seen colors, you know, it's... It's sort mm -hmm. of the term that's often used as ineffable. And um, I think it's, and Reed and I have talked about this before too, it, it can be really helpful to try to F the ineffable, as one might say, like to try yeah, to give try. words to these to experiences. Try. It's yeah. an exercise, right? Yeah. And I've had a lot of fun doing that. I mean, I like going on your first ayahuasca or DMT journey or something really deep is kind of like a horse going parachuting. Mm. <laughs> Then the horse will come back to the barn and it'll say to all his horse buddies, you guys won't believe it. It was oh. like I was above the barn, but then I could somehow see the barn, even though I wasn't like in the barn. And then I fell into the barn and his horse buddies are like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. That's the same way with an ayahuasca journey or the, you, you just can't describe it, but it is fun to try. And often what gets described are sort of the, the, the harrowing things like, like a couple of buddies might describe, I don't know, uh, a fishing trip or something that went, went awry. It's like, Oh yeah, well there was all this vomiting yeah. and there was screaming. And then this one person thought they were Jesus and, but it was really great. Yeah. And I passed through this Willy Wonka cave of horrors and found myself in a bliss field of Elysium. And, and, uh, people were like, what the hell? I don't think I want to do that, man. You're not a good salesman. I know. <laughs> Especially at the beginning, I sold very few of my friends on ayahuasca journeys mm -hmm. because I would come back wide eyed and into my newspaper where I was working at the time and be like, I was climbing up a ladder full of light, rung by rung by rung. And then the light got even brighter and brighter. So I came to the center of the light and it turned out that the ladder was my own spinal column and the center of the light was my own brain. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and my friends are just like, what are you talking about? He's lost You're, it. <laughs> you've lost it, man. And I'd be like, you guys, you just got to try it. And honestly, that's what's gotten me into, kept me into this for, for so long. It's just like, 
I just think at the beginning, I was like, you got to see this. Like, hey, buddy. Hey, brother. Hey, mom. You got to see this. Mm -hmm. That, it turns out, doesn't work because the more you say it, the more crazy you look and the more <laughs> it just doesn't it just doesn't you can't engage with it. And that's why as my writing has gone on and on, I've found that the thing that people can hear more and more is these other ancillary benefits or or, or downsides, you know, things that come in and are out of it. Because like if it is like a parachute journey, then you can describe jumping out of a plane. If that's not for you, that's not for you. But if you've jumped out of a plane and it made you more invigorated and alive and then the rest of your day went better, that's what people can understand and grab onto. And so that's been how I've talked about it more and more. Mm -hmm. I still do like to talk about the craziness, but it's, mm -hmm. I've learned what people can hear a little bit more. Um, yeah. Late, late at night, I'll talk to you more about the uh, climbing <laughs> through my own spinal column. Right. It is yeah, a funny... I'm Oh, go ahead, Steve. Well, I was just going to say this. What you're saying, Riley, just reminds me of like why Reed and I started the podcast. Um, when you look at the landscape of the so-called psychedelic renaissance, there are lots of different folks playing different roles. Reed and I are both licensed clinicians, like we're into the psychedelic research and practice and training. And then you have folks like you, like journalists, reporters, storytellers. And, for you know, we can't, we can never, we can really never, for example measure the impact that, that a book like how to change your mind had on mm -hmm. this movement on somebody who's an expert in investigation and storytelling. So I see, or, you know, organizations like healing maps and, and just what you're doing personally rally is a really important role in communicating, you know, as, as artfully, but also clearly as possible to the uninitiated, especially when some of those uninitiated folks are the ones writing policy or the ones approving or not approving um, certain drugs or the ones making donations to organizations that do this research. Yeah. And that's what healing maps tries to do a lot is people come looking for something. Now mm -hmm. they've heard these things about psychedelics. And so they want to know, okay, I have addiction. I have depression. I want to explore my inner spiritual life. How can I do that? What's nearby? What's what fits my needs? What are the qualifications of the people that own the clinics? Are they trained? Are they licensed? What do other people say about it? And just to give them that, that way, that entrance, the same way you would look for an ear specialist or an eye specialist or a chiropractor. What's their training? What's they, how do they, you know, work with things? So we're trying to be that entrant point for people on their, you know, on their, on their way. Just people, are, people have troubles and oh, people yeah. are looking for answers. Yeah. And when we were chuckling about uh, how hard of a sell ayahuasca is to the uninitiated, um, I, I also couldn't help but think about how, on the other side of that, how inspiring it is that so many people seek out these crazy medicines because of that, that uh, kind of inner drive or spark or uh, call to action that comes from um, whatever is going on in their life, often suffering, right? Seeking help and uh, d willing to do anything. You know, there is this like inextinguishable light that is so inspiring in people where they'll go to great lengths, um, great lengths to heal and grow. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even for me, I was interested in it as like an adventure, but also because my girlfriend's mom said that it helped her stomach ache. Mm -hmm. and it was just so puzzling. Like, why would this thing that gives you such strange visions also help your stomach? Mm -hmm. And those are questions that are still interesting. Um, but yeah, I wanted a better, happier life. And I think that's what a lot of people do. So people come to healing maps, like by the scores and they write us all these messages saying, here's my problem. What can I do? Who do you have in Baltimore that can help me for my PTSD? Who do you yeah. know in Port Townsend that can look after my anxiety? Can microdosing work? Can, mm -hmm. can 5 meo help? Can this help? And it's such a tough thing to navigate for a lot of people. And it, anything that any of us can do, your podcast or healing maps or all the great people talking on Reddit and Twitter and, and yeah, it can help mm -hmm. direct because a lot of us are just flailing around. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Um, how's it going at healing maps, by the way, anything you can share about the, 
the uh, the trajectory it's been on, and also wondering if if on there you list like psychedelic clinical trials options. Just a curiosity that came up. Yeah, we do. If you go um, onto our page, it has a, a box where you can say what you're looking for. I'm looking for ibogaine treatment or ketamine treatment. Uh, interested in joining a clinical trial, we have a um, place where you enter your name and we'll let you know if there is a clinical trial in your area. Um, it's the, the response we're getting is really good from people that are finding their way to places and um, seeing people connect with, with new places is really exciting. It's been a fun place to be a part of and, and feel like you're playing a role in getting people a place that they might not have known to get to. It's also really exciting watching the way the clinics are developing, the way they are getting more savvy, more trained. They are sometimes getting more like multifaceted, adding like craniosacral or chiropractic or uh, hot and cold or, um, you know, heat, heat therapy or, or cold plunges or all these things that are, mm -hmm. these ketamine clinics are in Colorado and other places are starting to look like these like retreats that you see in Costa Rica for psilocybin. And it's a really cool thing because it's like in a year or two, there's probably going to be psilocybin in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And so these places are ramping up to try to serve that. And, um, yeah, so Healing Maps is a good place to go. You, you, put, you go to our homepage, you put in where you are, you put in where you want to go, and then we'll show you the, the offerings around you. And we look at them and see what's good and tell you what's going on with them. So it's, cool. it's been a real place that I found a lot of meaning as feeling like I'm playing a useful role in the world. Yeah, I think it's incredibly useful. And especially in this, in this time we are, or this, I guess, moment we are in time relative to the, the progression of what, what we call the psychedelic renaissance, where there is an increasing amount of awareness and excitement about treatments, psychedelic assisted treatments. Um, but still, some of the most powerful medicines are not yet legal, right? In most of the states in Utah, or excuse me, the states in, uh, in the U.S., um, so I, I notice you've got, you know, referral sources to out of country retreats on the website as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, mostly it's ketamine because that's what's legal right now. And that's what's in every corner. Um, but we're also finding that ketamine can do more than we thought it could. Mm -hmm. The ketamine can be a really powerful healing tool for a lot of people. Because it gets you to a place that's so perspective shifting the way we were talking about ayahuasca and um so there's a lot of interest in ketamine and that's been cool there's a lot of interest in trainings we're having a lot of people come to us and and want to know how to get trained and um it's one of these things you know you, you do a, a great psychedelic journey and then you're like oh i i want to be a part of this especially if you're a therapist you're already some kind of a healer yeah um, yeah, you know, sometimes people will ask us, is ketamine a placeholder? Are we just sort of being satisfied with ketamine while we're waiting for other medicines? And uh, I'd love to hear your opinion, Reed, but we usually say the same thing, that no, ketamine is not simply a, a placeholder. It is a unique and powerful medicine. And I think with more research and more clinical experience, we'll get a better sense and more and more precision with, like, which medicine might be good for which problems um and what types of psychotherapy approaches might be good with which medicines but i don't think ketamine is going away no reed did you have thoughts about that yeah I, I agree it's a fun question but um it's there's no doubt in my mind um now because we've been working with ketamine a long time at, at numinous and my first ketamine study was in 2010 and it has a place in the healing journey, the mental health uh, um, toolkit, um, for sure, regardless. And, and it will be really interesting to see how, how that unfolds as the, the classic and other psychedelics like MDMA become available, because, you know, we already can see some ways that ketamine can help, help people um, get ready for that or continue to integrate and things like that. 
and it's certain things it's like good it's better for like bipolar right where you wouldn't want to put someone who's bipolar onto a classic psychedelic but ketamine you feel somewhat safe doing it right and that's a large number of people yeah although interestingly yesterday in jama a study came out that compass um was involved it was a compass study but it, i think an investigator initiated one psilocybin for bipolar depression that was really positive small study but <laughs> um but uh, that's, that's uh, yeah unfolding as well <laughs> yeah that's exciting that's cool yeah i don't think it's going anywhere i think it's good for Right, like suicidal ideation, rapid response to that, it seems to be better, right? Um, and then also it can be just like a mushroom trip in a lot of ways. Like I did a training up in the foothills at this great um, retreat center in the mountains with like nature around, and we did a ketamine journey outside. And it was a little mm -hmm. bit different than a psilocybin journey outside because you're a little bit more inward, you're not like engaging mm -hmm. with the trees quite as much but it had so many of the same great attributes you know where you are just that ceremonial thing being outside being with yourself being with another person talking about the most important things in the world and so and, and ketamine is legal in all over the world and so that is just highly replicable um in a way that some of these other things are going to take a little more time Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's so true. So, Riley, you mentioned a second ago training. So, um, one of the other, one of the several reasons we wanted to talk to you on the podcast is that uh, you have some unique perspectives on training. Not the least of which is you took Numinous's Fundamentals of Psychedelic Assisted Therapy training course with us. You're you're one of our with students. You. Yeah. <laughs> yes. With you, I had you on my uh, Zoom screen for three hours. A day, a week, for eight weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, got to appreciate your beard and your your shiny head and all the great things about you. That's those are the two great things about me. I, uh, <laughs> the things that I've embraced: this ridiculous beard and my beautifully <laughs> shined head. Um, yeah. So apart from bas something... basking in my glory, yeah. What what else did you uh, what else did you experience as part of our training program? Any critiques or remaining questions? Well, I want to say that it was really well done it, from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. I thought you guys did a tremendous job from onboarding to the graphic design, to the flow of it, to the way the Zoom worked, to the homework, to the, the online portal. Like everything was really top notch, solid, flowy, well thought out. It's like I could tell you guys put, put a lot of attention on every corner of that. And that was really appreciated. Um, it was really a, a fun training. I looked forward to it every Friday. Um, it didn't feel like a training. It felt like a real joy and, um, didn't feel like three hours. It felt like, you know, it, it's the time flew by. So I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot about some of the corners of therapy ish things that I don't necessarily know a lot about and that are helpful for me in um, sitting for people, um, these interrelational, interpersonal attachment styles and the, how to deal with trauma was a huge thing that I hadn't totally like dived into. Um, you know, you would think having been on the ambulance, dealing with a lot of people like currently undergoing trauma, that I would have a better idea of what trauma means and how it affects people and, um, how people react to it. But I really didn't, you know, and, in the medical profession, we just, we stitch up your wounds, we get you more blood and, and you move on. But so to, to think about how to, how to handle people with trauma. And I think just overall, hopefully it give, it's given me like softer hands, if you know what I mean. Mm. Being able to like, you know, it's just roughed, um, sanded off some of the edges of my sitting skills and, and so um, also sort of given me an appreciation of how much more there is to learn. I know you guys have more classes. I took the uh, fundamentals class. And then there's also like the next one that really appealed to me was embodied inquiry, because mm -hmm. I find that really useful in a psychedelic session, getting people to feel their mm -hmm. own body, what's going on there. I think that question just cannot be asked 
almost enough in a psychedelic mm-hmm. session and in life generally. Like, what are you actually feeling? Yeah, I love what yeah. you you wrote an article, I think, on Healing Maps about what what I learned from a psychedelic uh, therapy training, right? And uh, yeah. that, that's one section that jumped out at me is, uh, I think, what you called body, 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 or just like shifting, uh, shifting your perspective on that or expanding it. Um, and uh, I like how you pointed out that even the term psychedelic, if you define it as mind manifesting, can feel a bit limiting. Just like the term mindfulness, I've always thought could be called bodyfulness, even though that sounds awful, mm-hmm. but but it's more a telling, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I didn't get the most out of psychedelic psychotherapy as a as a client until I had a therapist that was like, just feel your body. Like, what do you feel right now? Cause I was talking and I was thinking and I was, I was story ideating. And then she just said, what does, what do you feel on your body? And yeah, as I wrote in that article, this should be called somadelic or something like that. Body manifesting. Where's your breath at? Where's your muscles at? Where are you tight? Where are you loose? What happens when you think about your boss or your ex-wife or your child or your, your dead grandfather? What, what does that do in your body? Because we just walk around not thinking about this thing all the time, and it's 95% of who we are. And so... Yeah, you know, it's, you'll hear other terms that people proposed to use in, in lieu of the term psychedelic, and intactogen is one that sometimes people will use, like getting into contact with not only your body, but all the things that are sort of on the menu to get in contact with. But I think, like you said, or like you alluded to... um a lot of us are chronically disconnected from our bodies. And I was listening to a really fascinating podcast interview with Andrew Huberman. I think he was on the Tim Ferriss show. And, you know, Huberman's this Stanford neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the vagus nerve. He's talking about the body and how important sleep is and physical health is and exercise. And he talks about how the distinction between mind and body, brain and body, is a false distinction. That we, we are a sort of a whole being. And if we're not paying attention to those signals from the body, then yeah, we're, like you said, at least leaving some large percentage of the data on the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to more Huberman lately and the way he breaks down the ways that your outside environment affects you. And those are things that you can control. Like he just talks a lot about blue light late at night Mm -hmm. or like caffeine earlier in the day. And you often think like, oh, I'm, I don't feel good. It must be because my work is hard or, or my relations hard or whatever. But it's, it might be because you just didn't get enough sleep. You took too much blue light. And all of those things you just forget about. And, and it's the same with psychedelic psychotherapy where it's like, oh, I'm sad because my, something bad happened in my life or I didn't get the attachment from my dad that I wanted. But also you're not sleeping. You're not exercising. You're not going out in nature. You're not doing all of those things. And I find that on psychedelics, my body really talks to me. Mm. Yeah, like it says like I want more exercise. I want better food. I want more time with my friend. Yeah, what do you even, think? yeah. Even even your emotions that Steve and I like to talk about a lot, and you know, I view as these like super important signals that give us information about how to navigate life in a good way. Like, but but the way they'll show up is through the body. And like Steve said, I um, it's something I've come to realize. Uh, when I was, I was an EMT as well before med school. Um, it was along along the way, but, uh, but just all these, all these, uh, kind of chapters of training in different ways in mind, body, and then the psychedelic experiences above all else, it really does show you that the mind and the body are, are mutually interactive, influential. You engage the body, you engage the uh, psychological qualities, the emotional qualities within yourself. Um, and there's so many examples of that. And like you said, even, uh, I heard Steve sent me the recent, uh, Tim Ferriss interview with Huberman and in the opening, they're talking about, um, vision and how, you know, how you interact with the world and, and how that has inner and outer effects. And just like you said, every, every organ system, you could kind of tie in one way to this idea of embodiment, psychosomatics, and the mind-body connection. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah, it is wild. And, and Steve, you must bring it in a lot when you do psychedelic psychotherapy, asking people to feel their bodies. 
Yeah, you know, uh, on the lines of that embodied inquiry class that we teach here at Numinous and the, the little bit that we covered in the fundamentals course, um, especially for those folks who are intellectualizers. And, yeah. you know, Riley kind of sounds like you have that tendency. I certainly have that tendency. <laughs> I want to yeah. make sense out of it, right? I want it to be clear. I want it to be fully manifested. I want to know what it means. Yeah. And that's often a trap. I mean, certainly there's a time for meaning making, but during the psychedelic experience itself, we want to take advantage of this plastic state. And um, I love, I love, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it's like, um, there's so much we can learn from our bodies during yeah. a psychedelic experience. So there's a lot of practices that you can do to help people drop down out of the mind into the body. And uh, it can help them move through what feel like spinning their wheels in a psychedelic session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I love that point you brought up as well, Riley. Of the what we can learn from the body, it's because it's not just how we experience satisfaction, presence, connection, like all that important stuff. But but you know, my view of it in in therapy, um, and this, this has been evolving, is that. You know, it's tricky to tackle challenges through just the labyrinth of the mind. And we're all really good at mental gymnastics. But when you're embodied, you get to question the stories you hold and tell about yourself and others in, in this new way. Like you, you, an example, you can notice what's alive and resonating in you and ask yourself, like, why am I absencing instead of presencing right now to, I mean, absencing, I don't even know if that's a real wor word or presence yeah, for that matter, but we'll make it, yeah. we'll make them words because when you're sure. like grounded in your body, even when triggered and reactive, you, you have this resource, this capacity to observe and, and see what's going on. And, and when you have that comfort in your body, you can start to experience more and more of a, deep connection with the world around you while still inhabiting your body. And, and then you start to like feel the environment and your body. It's this fascinating attunement thing that, that we learn by doing this work that where you can tune into your body and it helps you tune into the world and other people. Yeah. 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 I'm you guys in the training had us do these role playing exercises with our group mates where we would just spend time, asking each other, what do we feel in our bodies? And then, and that was just how often in your day on a Friday morning, do you stop and feel what's in your body? You know, if you're a super enlightened guys like you, you probably do it a lot. Um, I don't. And it, it was just so good to then play the who that exercise that is so useful, whether you're in psychedelics or not, of, okay, I have tightness in the shoulders, I have tightness in my back. And then what, what comes up for you when you feel that tightness in the shoulders and that tightness in the back? Where's that, where's that from? What are you doing there? Okay, I think about my boss and then it's tight there. Okay, what happens when you think about your boss like this? What happens when you think about your daughter that you love and what happens in your body there? I just found that exercise, that role playing to be super useful and interesting and I never got tired of doing that. Yeah. I love those group exercises. Yeah. And I think, you know, the word inquiry is important there because what you just uh, demonstrated for everybody was a gentle, curious inquiry, right? It's, it's not embodied interrogation, right? It's not, it's not aggressive. It's not, we're not really trying to peel back layers to get to this, to quote unquote truth. We're trying to just experience what's there that we're typically blind to. I, I was in a, a couple more thoughts about the body and psychedelic experience. I was in an ayahuasca circle once where the man leading the, the circle was giving some navigation tips. And one of the things he said was, you know, in and through, try to surrender. But if you, if you find yourself stuck, move your body, change your body posture. And I would mm -hmm. see people in the circle, like curled up in the fetal position, seemingly really stuck. And, you know, he'd be singing, singing the Icaros and he'd go over and it, his presence would remind them that they could shift, or maybe there was an energetic message there. Who knows? I don't claim to know all things, but, and then they would shift, they'd sit up, they'd throw their shoulders back and they'd move to a new chapter of the experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You don't realize how, I don't realize how much I'm tight mm -hmm. in different places. And there's no, I mean, it's, if, you, if you go to parts work, which is something that you guys taught us a lot about and that I do, it's like um, this different part of me is, is playing a role that's supposed to be protective. So I'm, I'm tight here because I'm protecting myself from the scary thing that, that comes 
if I were to open up more. I'm afraid of opening up because then I would be vulnerable or something like that. And so learning from your body and, and like you said, not in an aggressive way, but just in like, oh, that's, that's me trying to help myself. That's me trying to like look out for myself by, by being protected. And then you can ask as a, as a follow-up if possible, like, well, do I need to do that? Mm-hmm. Is that helping me? And again, ask it, like you're saying, as a, as a real question. Maybe you do. Maybe life is hard for you. And maybe you're not ready to open up, but maybe you are. Yeah, I love the way you're demonstrating that. Sort of, like I said, the gentleness and the curiosity. You mm-hmm. also mentioned earlier in our conversation about like the, the way some of these clinics that you're aware of are trying to be more integrative, um, where it's not just, you know, get your ketamine, take two of these, call me in the morning kind of thing. And um, yeah. I'm aware of some psychedelic practitioners, and I'm also aware of, of like some of the the potential pitfalls with what I'm about to say. Um, but some psychedelic practitioners will have body workers with them as they're doing the psychedelic journey. And I know of one person who was having a really hard time getting into the psychedelic experience, a hard time letting go, just very, feeling very disoriented. They got on the massage table and each area of the body that was being massaged suddenly came to life and revealed something about the past. This person was actually ex- re-experiencing repressed trauma unlocked from specific areas in their body where they had maybe so-called stored that pain. And if you read a book like Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score, it becomes apparent to you why that might be and how that might be. Yeah. So what are we going to do with that? Because I have similar stories from my own life, from people around me. Um, and so what do we do with that? If we're, How do we stay safe? You know, like, just literally, what do you guys think is going to happen? Do you think there's going to be psychedelics and body work or going forward? I would love for there to be. So this is another sort of thing that we had maybe talked about exploring. Like there's so many different ways historically that psychedelics have been used to help people heal, to, for initiations, for spiritual exploration. We recently released an episode with, um, with Chris Bache talking about using high LS, high dose LSD sessions to go on cosmological explorations, right? And understand the mysteries of the universe. So like I, like I mentioned earlier, Reed and I are, are licensed clinicians. We're in the sort of Western medical milieu and, and trying to use those tools to bring psychedelics uh, in a healing way to people who might need them. And so I think there are going to be different containers and contexts in which psychedelics can be used. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can be really uh, like not territorial about it, but like you implied, Riley, with a keen eye towards safety. There have been some fairly high profile cases of people being harmed, even in clinical trials by people they were meant to feel safe with. And, you know, there, I, I, this is maybe a little pejorative, but I'm a little skeptical of so-called backyard shamans, right? The, the Westerners who maybe had an ayahuasca experience in Southern California and all of a sudden they're going to serve the medicine to everybody. And psychedelics can, uh, are sometimes called non-specific amplifiers and sometimes they can amplify some not so good traits in people and they start taking advantage of others. So yeah, I'm not and sure the person is, is so vulnerable. Yeah, for sure. You're not sure what I was going to say. I'm not, I'm not sure um, like what shape this will take in the future, but I'm hoping that it will be flexible again w- within the, the confines of prioritizing safety for people. Yeah. Uh, Reed, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, a big question of like, but I agree with what Steve just said, prioritizing safety and, and back to the question of, you know, what about these other modalities and body work and everything else? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it'll be an evolution and it's uh, in part a logistical question. Working in the healthcare space, we see the protocols of the studies coming and the protocols, therefore, that are submitted to the FDA for potential approval and will guide the treatment protocol. But then once things are on the market, there's the the absolutes. You can only give something this way, like Spravato is approved as ketamine, has to be given in clinic, period. But in the studies, they only let people with, say, depression and nothing else. But now we can give it to people with depression and eating disorders. Or the protocol might have said, you know, 
twice a week and that for a month, once a week for a month. But, but if someone can't make it and where we have to do something different, we can. And what someone does in parallel, even though those are often excluded in studies, um, as we learn more and more of these and people publish cases and share their experiences and people do studies, then we'll have even more to guide us. And, you know, I think more likely people get be getting their massage at a different location than, then they get their MDMA assisted psychotherapy just because that's how our system is is structured um, for the most part. But you know it doesn't doesn't have to be. And I think we're seeing psychedelics um, as this great example of the move towards more holistic healthcare. And um, like this integrative idea has been present in in the uh, alternative medicine and holistic uh, wellness space. And, and I do think psychedelics helps bring that in by, by shining a light of awareness on the needs there as well as so many other things. It's just gonna be so interesting because you have these two sort of like, so for it's polars, or, or I don't wanna say polar because they're not necessarily against each other, but when, you guys do these clinical trials, it's like you have to be so hands off, you have to be so, because you're testing, because it's so complicated, right? And so you don't want to be doing a massage, I mean, for many reasons in a clinical trial, but because you want to know whether it's the drug plus the psychotherapy that does it. And so you don't want to be doing a singing bowl or anything like that, that could take, that could add a variable, right? And so that, that makes sense, and I get that. And then, like, you go to a Shipibo ceremony where they are healing you with their song. Or you do it in this underground way where they're, maybe they are moving your muscles, touching you, pushing on your body. And it's much more about a, a healer that's actually trying to heal as opposed to, as opposed to so those two things. I'm not expressing myself very well, but do you guys get what I'm saying? How there's, like... Yeah. One side that, that is more like we're trying to heal you. We're bringing in these things and we're going to heal you. And then the, the, the thing in the clinical trials and what we learned in our therapy, in our training, is you're trying to get people in touch with their own inner healing intelligence. Mm -hmm. But the healing comes from within. And this is where we're going to come. Just playing with just those, those things mm -hmm. are super interesting to me of like what's, how does all, can all of those things work? I mean, I think they do all work. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the question in there is where does the healing come from and how is it facilitated, right? That's one, well, I guess one way to, to think about this conversation. And like, like you alluded to, at least in our training and the way a lot of the clinical trials are pioneered, I guess, by MAPS and the, their way of their approach, they approached MDMA, the way they're operating is to get out of the way of the medicine, so to speak. And some of that's to control for variables, like you said, in a clinical trial, we want to make sure that the the interventions, the minimal interventions that we do, are trackable, traceable, measurable, and in what's the synergistic synergistic effect between those and what we think is going on with the medicine. But also, it's a uh, it, it's um, also comes from a philosophy of psycho of psychotherapy, a philosophy of the human mind, and. I think an effort not to be too presumptuous, you know, in, in some psychotherapy philosophies, uh, you are the catalyst for change as the therapist, you know, you're going to introduce, you're going to help them draw their attention to their thinking errors, their cognitive distortions. And then you're going to mm -hmm. give them the tools by psychoeducation to change the way that they think. Um, and then there are more person centered approaches where the focus is more on the quality of the so-called therapeutic relationship, right? And when you look at psychotherapy outcome literature, to the extent that you can measure such a thing, they find that the quality of the therapeutic relationship, whether or not there's a good bond, you know, an alliance around the goals, whether or not you feel like your therapist is listening and, and is empathic and understands you and is compassionate, that those things account for more of the positive change in psychotherapy than the specific interventions, whether I'm doing EMDR or whether I'm doing cognitive behavioral therapy or IFS. Those data change a little bit depending on the condition. Some conditions respond really, really well to specific therapeutic interventions. But generally speaking, that's what the data say, that their therapeutic relationship is really, really valuable. And a lot of you listeners who've been in therapy uh, and, you, and people ask you, well, what helped? A lot of times what you remember is, I got to talk to somebody who actually listened to me. 
I got to talk to somebody I didn't have to take care of. And they were really paying attention. And I could tell they were paying attention. It felt like they cared about me. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of us don't get that in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. We, <clears throat> so we've learned about the relationship-centered approach. And it is about that, that thing between the client and the therapist. And how does that, like... How does that work in psychedelic psychotherapy if we're just doing like the one and done thing, do you think? Where you're just going to come into these places, like the way it's going to work, you're going to just going to do MDMA once or you're going to do psilocybin once. Do you think you'll still be able to have that same level of healing or do you think it will need to be with a recurring person that you have a relationship with? You know, one way to to think about it uh, that comes to mind, and I want to hear what, what Steve thinks, but, but uh, you know, if you think of psychotherapy as this uh, intervention in mental health, uh, where it's actually the intervention is a dialogue about the, the inner world of the client um, guided by the therapist, and it includes the, re the relationship of that inner world, inner and outer to others, um, both the relationship of the client and the therapist in the room in sessions and all the relationships the client has in the world. And, and that uh, in general is, is built and uh, becomes more and more useful over lots of sessions. But I think why the psychedelic state is so appealing to so many therapists is, is it kind of, it accelerates this. It like blows the lid off of like you were saying about your experiences your personal reality and if we look from like a mechanistic state of view the default mode network is is the steady state we're in in our lived reality and psychedelics like interrupt it and dr dramatically increase the new way of experiencing stuff and insights and not just like oh a thought insight but that visceral knowing or that embodied insight coming from within you but uh and that's why i think uh, one way that these limited sessions, like a single dose of psilocybin with lasting change, um, involving a therapist still, but uh, but it it prioritizes the inner healer, right? Yeah, I mean, I love the inner healer approach. Like, I just think that's so useful for a lot of reasons. One is that it absolves the therapist or the sitter from this guru complex, where it's like I'm the all knowing. Two, because you can carry it with you your whole life. You can stop therapy and you'll still have access to your own inner healer. And three, because I think it's really self-empowering. And my only concern with it is that it is a little bit individualistic and different from the thing that they do in more traditional ceremonies where it's about the community and you come together. And so that's an interesting difference. Steve, do you have thoughts about that? Like, Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a yes and. Um, you mentioned community. It's something that I think we struggle with in sort of the allopathic approach in the Western medical world to so-called mental illnesses, right? Um, and certainly there are things that psychedelics are doing at the level of the neurons. Reed mentioned the default mode network and the increase in neuroplasticity, perhaps like Gould, Gould Dolan's research indicates opening you know, windows of um, development uh, and critical critical windows of development, right? Social learning. Yeah. That, that could be helpful independent of how skilled your therapist is or independent of whether or not you had, uh, you know, an indigenous shaman facilitating you or whether you just did mushrooms at a Grateful Dead concert, right? Um, those things are possible. We have reports of people experiencing incredible benefits from using psychedelics in all sorts of contexts. But, you know, from at least my perspective, the, um, the risk that it's going to be destabilizing, unhelpful, or even damaging goes up when um, those variables of set and setting aren't controlled for. So if anything, a therapist doing psychedelic, if, if the intent is healing or growth, doing a psychedelic medicine in a therapeutic context is going to set the table for and increase the likelihood for a more healing experience, a more, more intimate contact with your inner healer. I like the way you yeah. said it, Riley, that, you know, this inner healer is something that you get to carry with you. I also think it, it is simply the nature of the human psyche. And, you know, the, our, my psychotherapy for, for fathers, forebears would say so like Carl Rogers, this idea that with, mm -hmm. within a context of unconditional positive regard, a person will move towards self-actualization. 
Um, I think those are beautiful theories and I see them play out in my own work. Um, yeah. Read mm-hmm. any other follow-up thoughts? Yeah. I, um, it's a really interesting thought because I think like you're both saying, and like you pointed out, Riley, the, the idea is kind of unique to psychotherapy because we view this mind as something fixed um, and we're either like deliberately thinking or taking action that, and that'll change our thoughts, feeling behaviors, like all these traditional psychotherapies. There have been a lot of psychotherapies make reference to something like the inner healer, like Steve's pointing out, whether it's called the unconscious or the wise Mm -hmm. mind self energy from IFS, uh, the body itself as, uh, uh, like your a personal healing intelligence. Um, but then psychedelic assisted psychotherapy just brings this home and, and recognizes that, that there's this, there's this force beyond the kind of the rational and, and the verbal and the logical and that is at play, you know, and it play in many ways, like healing us from a laceration, um, same way seeds want to become plants or trees are going to grow towards the sun. Um, and it, it does, uh, challenge the paradigm in big ways. But, uh, but like you said, if we could all have our inner healer on speed dial, like how useful is that through your life? Yeah. Yeah, I have a great setup right now where my regular therapist is my psychedelic psychotherapist. And so we do regular talk therapy. Well, we do parts work and somatic therapy every week. Cool. And then every every so often we do a psychedelic session. And it's just so good because I trust him so much. He knows so much about me. And we can just dive right in when I'm on the medicine. Oh, you were talking about your... You this part, your your five year old part, your um, this part, that part. What what's it like now? Now that you have more access to it, and and boy, do those guys start talking when I'm on psychedelics. And so I think that, at least in my life so far, that's been the optimal way to do it is to have this years long relationship with this person as a therapist, and then every once in a while inject psychedelics into it. It's been really good. I know that's not going to be super accessible to everybody, certainly not now, but Riley, that's, that's my dream as a clinical psychologist who's found, who found psychedelics after treating thousands of people. Um, and that's the way I use it, use psychedelics in my practice, frankly, is uh, in the context of, a, of an already well-established therapeutic relationship. And certainly there are clinics, and Numinous is one of them, where um, you know, you're going to go in for a series of ketamine treatments. You're going to get preparation. You're going to get integration. You're going to get psychological support. It might not be in the context of a very long, thoroughly established therapeutic relationship like the one that you have. And so there are different levels of care, different ways we want to give people access to these healing and potentially, potentially transformative tools. Um, but yeah, I, for me, I think that is pretty optimal. Yeah, I think that it's, it may be hard to do, but I think it is doable. Um, don't you think? Yeah, I do it. <laughs> so it's clearly doable. <laughs> You're doing it. It's clearly doable. It's the question is whether it's doable at scale is still one that's unanswered, I guess. Because you'd need to have all these regular therapists take the training and get approved and all that. And that's just too big of a hurdle, we think. No, I don't think all that's too big. It is a hurdle though. Like it is a training therapist is definitely, mm-hmm. um, Definitely a challenge, which is one of the reasons Numinous is committing so much energy and capital to to training. That's why organizations yeah. like MAPS are trying hard to train. And lots of other great organizations out there doing trainings like uh, Psychedelics Today, IPI, CIS. There's um, mm. a lot of good trainings out there. Um, and I think it, there's also just a challenge, like Reed was talking about earlier, when medicines like MDMA and psilocybin get FDA approved, Um, We still don't know exactly what those treatments are going to look like from a regulatory perspective. And Reed probably has some better opinions about the more informed opinions about this than I do. On the, on what part of it, the regulatory challenge? Yeah, just, you know, because the FDA has never regulated a psychotherapy before. They produce a REMS to regulate the prescription of a drug, but the combination of the two is we're, we're kind of in uncharted territory. Yeah, that was a fun um, topic we had within the last few months of 
that paper that came out on um, that we referenced looking at the role of therapy in psychedelic medicine. And the fact of the matter is, is like, we don't have all the answers yet. And, you know, we all have our biases. We, we sometimes have some damn good assumptions, but, but, uh, you know, in the end, it does come down to that approval of like, what does the FDA say about it that will let it go from a schedule one, banned substance with terrible penalties only available in these um, in these select studies to being you know prescribable and and uh, the role of therapy and we see more and more sponsors de-emphasizing or calling it different things in part because we don't all know all the answers and we have to test these and also to help it go through this tricky system uh, that we're in. But um, so, yeah, there's a lot to, there's a lot to understand there still. And like with maps, you're going to need two with the MDMA, you're going to need two people in the room. It's is my most recent understanding. Mm-hmm. And that is going to be a big, a big hurdle, you know, that's yeah. going to be very, very expensive. That, I think, highlights uh, one of the uh, other big bottlenecks or challenges to access, um, and one that highlights a lot of issues with, uh, you know, privilege and how certain people are neglected from availability to this or, or maybe because, uh, you know, two therapists for 40 hours of therapy, including the three six hour dosing sessions is very expensive. And, very expensive. Uh, and that's how it'll come out on, on approval and the insurance things are of course to be determined, but not everyone has insurance and, and that could be a fat copay for people too. Yeah. I think here again, maybe ketamine is a nice bridge because it is so accessible and you don't, you don't need much to, to introduce ketamine into your regular therapeutic relationship. You just get a lozenge sent to you and your therapist can fit for you. And that's a really cool way until, yeah, I mean, that's just like a nice stopgap. Another nice thing about ketamine at the moment. Yeah, and that highlights one of the other challenges that we kind of um, alluded to a bit of just navigating a system where that's not the uh, default uh, age-old paradigm of of having a lozenge and and how does one access these kind of things in a good way, a good safe way with with solid reputable folks in, in a world where it's uh, it, it is confusing uh, to navigate healthcare, mental health period and you introduce those other variables and and uh you know we see it all too often uh, that uh, there's a risk of clients getting lost um and not knowing and there's a risk of of bad players i i don't like the term bad of course but but the reckless work that happens sometimes with uh you know these strong medicines given in a wrong in the wrong way the wrong setting yeah yeah for sure it's easy to get addicted to ketamine it's an easy drug. It feels like there's no downside to it. So it's easy for people to just keep doing it and think it's not hurting them. You know, another potential pathway that we're not talking about is what's going on in, in Colorado and and Oregon. And, um, it sounds like you're pretty intimately familiar with what's going on in Colorado, just helping people get access to psilocybin in particular, but other plant medicines, um, in a more accessible way, if not like less regulated, but how's that playing out in Colorado? Yeah, so it's super new still, even though it's been on the books for a, a year and, and change. People are really figuring it out. Um, I'm part of trying to organize um, spaces for people to, to co-figure this out so that one person isn't just figuring it out. So I'm involved in at least three different groups here in Colorado, um, maybe four. The first is this... Uh, Denver Mushroom Cooperative, where we help people to grow their own mushrooms and um, create a container, a place where people can come back to, to say, okay, I grew this, then here's what happened. And it worked like this, it didn't work like this. And so that has been a very, that's like a self, like people just trying to do it on their own. And people just grow them, they take them in their backyard, and mostly it's fine, sometimes it's not. But the idea with the Denver Mushroom Cooperative is to 
have those regular meetings so people can check in and ask those critical questions. And if you see someone getting out there and too far in left field, kind of pull them back a little bit. Um, and uh, I also go regularly and I help with this uh, psychedelic professionals meetup, which is like therapists and doctors. And this is a monthly meetup um, in three different cities in Colorado, um, Boulder, uh, Fort Collins, Denver, sometimes Colorado Springs. And we have these lectures where people um, say, here's what's working, here's what's not. I'm a therapist, I'm a indigenous practitioner um, and trying to learn from each other. And people are just really, those are the kinds of spaces where people are talking about their experiments. You know, so I'll talk about what's working for me with my therapist where we just do regular therapy and then, you know, what I do. And then the guy who's Andean Cosmovision will say, here's how that's different from the way we do it down in the Andes. And the woman who's doing 5-MEO up in the hills said, here's, here's what's working for me. And then we have... You know, Adele LaFrance comes in and talks about talking about the bringing the family in and how important the family is. Um, and we have Craig Heacock come in and talk about um, how people get psychotic and, and what a problem that can be, especially he, he's more about weed, but people do go psychotic on these things. Um, so I wouldn't say I, I don't have any answer for you in terms of like, here's what people are doing, because people are doing a bunch of different things. It's still small, um, it's still irregular, but something new pops up every day where I see like, oh, there's a new church and that looks cool or that looks dicey. There's a new um, therapy practice that is using psilocybin. Oh, I didn't know that they were using psilocybin last week. They're just starting it this, this week. And like one clinic is doing psilocybin only with people that they know who are regular, there are their regulars so they can monitor them. And then there's another place where you can go and just do a one-off and just take, take mushrooms six hours and then go home. And so here in Colorado, we're just kind of looking at each other like, do you see, you know, is that working or is that not working? And it's just a very exciting time to be here. And I don't know which way it's going to go. Um, other than in a, a year or so, they're going to start taking applications for the more regulated model. And then that'll be a little bit more standardized, but it's still going to be very variable. So it's a super interesting time to be here. It's super, I mean, my high school self just can't believe that this is happening, you know? Yeah, it was a bit of a trip to go out to the the MAPS conference there in Colorado and just seeing, seeing people selling you mushrooms out in front of the conference center. Yep. Yep. And it's, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of mushrooms being sold, but again, people don't know exactly how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, there's a dispensary here. I wrote about them. I went there. Um, but there's an agreement, like maybe this isn't what we meant. Just people buying mushrooms and not having any support. That's not really what 122 was about. Right. It was more about community, more about relationships, more about um, less commercial than that. You know, mm -hmm. there's going to be commercial therapy places, but I don't think there's ever going to be just a store. Um, but if you go into a head shop and you ask the right head shop, they'll, they might have mushrooms behind the counter. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many things here in what you just said that, that people have strong opinions about that people disagree about, right. R related to cognitive Liberty and criminalization, decriminalization, free access, um, capitalism, you know, for-profit markets, uh, medical versus ceremonial use. And so I'm just rattling all these things off to say that that's a nuanced issue. And, um, I try hard not to express opinions, on things that I haven't done my research on. So I'll, I'll stay quiet about most of that. But what I can say is that I, I know that when kind of back to what I was saying earlier, as a therapist, I know that when paired with psychotherapy, um, with adequate preparation in the context of a really solid therapeutic relationship that, uh, psychedelics like psilocybin can be extremely helpful. I totally agree. And I think there's lots of data and anecdote going back decades that, that totally back that up. And 
and there's anecdotes. I mean, you just walk around the world and you see like a Grateful Dead show and that looks like a lot of people having a great time. And so what do we do? I mean, no one seems to be doing anything about any of this. I think in Colorado, it's the question of like, what is, what is the populace, the voting people, the district attorney, um, the people in the city council and the state legislature, the newspaper writers, what are they going to be okay with? Mm-hmm. Is it okay to just um, give them away? Is it okay to um, do it a one-off? Because it seems like you're protected to do it with your therapist. But is it your therapist if you just go to it one time and then you leave? Is that your therapist? Right. It's not clear. Um, it's a really interesting place. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just a big fan of, like, checking in and just constantly being in a, a network of people just to say, like, do you think this is okay? I don't know if this is okay. Do you think this is okay? Yeah, I think it's okay. Just... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm so impressed that you're involved in those community uh, initiatives Mm -hmm. because I think um, sometimes we have formal communities, like for instance, a licensing board in a state for a therapist to help keep people accountable to a certain ethical code. And then you have less formal communities um, like the, like the meetup groups you're talking about, but it's, I think it's key. I think community is key to, to educate each other, um, to hold each other to standards. Yeah, and that's how these things have always been done, you know, the, whether it's Shapiro Circles or, you know, Grateful Dead shows. If you saw your buddy at the show that got too high, then you'd pull him back down and, you know, help him come back to Earth. And so, yeah, the, it'll be interesting to see the interplay between having community and having regulations. So how can you still have people that you are that you are with and that you trust and that you um, that are your friends and your brothers and your sisters and your wives and, and mothers. And at the same time, go through a regulatory board that says you have to have this training and this licensure and do it in this way. And how are those two things going to line up? And is one going to um, prove more useful? Or are people going to be more drawn to one than the other? These are super interesting questions that are unfolding as we speak. Yeah. I was on a call with the district attorney the other day, and she's like, this, this dispensary, what do you think we should do about it? And everybody's like, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what we should do about it. <laughs> They're decriminalized, but you can't sell them. It's, sorry, Reed, what were you going to say? Oh, yeah, I was just uh, reflecting on what you were saying about uh, these these two approaches and just thinking of examples of how they are coming together. Or it's almost like this science and spirituality uh, dichotomy that's existed that, you know, we've all known needs to merge more and more. Um, and like some of the complementary alternative things coming into mainstream, but, but the reminds me of coming back from my first ayahuasca experience, both personally and working in, in a retreat setting. But, and, you know, I've shared with this with Steve before, maybe on here, but I was like, this changed the way I view ceremony and and ritual and the sacredness of the work we do, apart from whether a medicine grew in the dirt or a lab, um, you know, you can add the ritual and ceremony, you can create a container that's sacred. And I said, you know, never again am I working in in a way that doesn't at least pay some kind of attention to that. Yeah. And and that's why I think when whatever kind of training you do, like you have a deep training as a medical doctor, like you, you have studied a lot, Steve, you have studied a lot of the things you know about. And so looking at the landscape in Colorado, the people that seem to be safer are people that do have a deep background in something, whether that's medicine or therapy or indigenous lineage or mm-hmm. You know, sometimes even it's it's a hippie lineage where you've just been to a thousand Grateful Dead shows and talk people down on that. That's still a lineage, and it's still something that can guide you in those difficult moments. And so, yeah, I'm just a fan of people doing some kind of training um, and putting yourself in some kind of a um, 
lineage, some kind of a container, some kind of a thing where something came down to you and you're passing it on. Um, don't you guys think that it, it's just helpful to have some kind of something going on? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, how do you view it, Steve, in the the therapy world? Like, I'm thinking of medical training. You brought it up, Riley, and and you know you you know the system of training doctors, for example, is a little is a little rough and and changing. But but there's a reason you have to do ten thousand, literally more than ten thousand hours to. Um, of just time in the trenches and spending uh, time in uncomfortable um, settings where you're getting stretched and what's called pimped in the hospital setting of your your senior resident, chief resident, attending physician. They're going to ask you questions. You're there bright and early and sleep deprived, and and they're putting you on the spot in front of others, and and it's. Uh, it's an uncomfortable but accelerated kind of growth path, um, and that's kind of part of part of a, a lineage. But also, then who your teachers are determines so much of the work you do and what you learn along the way. But but what do you think, Steve? Yeah, I mean, in my mind, it's what it's one of the things a license. I'll speak for a psychotherapy license is trying to communicate to the public is that if I am a licensed therapist, it communicates that I have been through a certain level of training through an accredited training program that has to meet minimum standards to become accredited, right? And so that that can communicate a level of safety to the person who's coming to me like, oh, it sees my license on the wall. If, if I had it, I don't have it on the wall. But um, this person, I can, I can already feel, uh, whether it's justified or not, I already feel some confidence that this person knows their shit and they're gonna be able to keep me safe. Um, and then within each psychotherapy training program, you have sort of these microcosms of what you could call lineages. So, um, and that, that might be a lineage of a particular psychotherapeutic approach. It might be a lineage of a particular philosophy of psychology, and that's going to dictate kind of how I operate with my client, but it does communicate some, some competence. And so in, in a more unregulated environment, you might have somebody who's done the kind of study that you referred to, Riley, or who has worked under supervision or, you know, wor worked as an apprentice in an indigenous uh, context for years before they were allowed to serve the medicine. Um, like Reed, I had to do thousands of supervised hours showing my supervisors recorded sessions where I got feedback. You know, it was really, really rigorous. So there yeah. is, I think, a qualitative, potentially a qualitative difference between the, the dude in Santa Monica who did one psilocybin experience and is now going to sit for his friends versus somebody who is thoroughly trained and well licensed. That being said, there are still people who are thoroughly trained and licensed who harm people or just do terrible work. And yeah. there can be a, a bravado or an ego with some people who are licensed and, you know, they might see psychedelics and be like, oh, I could use those. I don't need any extra training. And I have a bias against that. I think, you know, even if you were a stellar therapist, this is different territory. These tools are very specific tools and you need good training and supervision and experience before you use them. Yeah, the main thing I don't see in the Colorado um, law, and I don't know if they are going to have it for MDMA, is supervision and mentorship. Like to me, that's the a big, big missing piece. Because you're going to have to do 200 hours worth of training, go through a state licensing thing and then you're going to get shot out and if you're just working on your own you know you, you just need to check in with people and see how you're doing read do you know if you're going to be an mdma therapist are you going to have to have ongoing mentorship with other mdma therapists steve you may know this too yeah so um the best i know and i have had some recent conversations at least heard about how the training path forward is being conceptualized, but it's been that way in clinical trials, and that's the way um, I think most people are assuming it will be, is having at least initially a supervised work. Like you have a supervisor, mentor, teacher, if you will, who, um, and this may be virtually like watching a video of your first X number of sessions, and you, like the way it works in, uh, in our world clinically, um, and you know, S Steve and I have 
run uh, countless of these kind of supervision groups over over the years with our clinicians and others, and and Steve does a lot of them more than I do these days. And um, it's uh, talking about the cases and learning from one another, and and uh, in a similar vein. But but yeah, I think that'll be a part of getting fully certified in the MDMA therapy world. Um, and uh, I think an important one, even though. Uh, we all got to work on the bottleneck and the the urgent need for access to. Yeah, the bottleneck is huge, and because like you want to see, you want to learn from the better MDMA providers above you, but there just aren't that many, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, it's to be determined. But I think uh, the supervision, the uh, the aim is to be able to do that virtually, you know, for that access challenge in part. Yeah. Yeah. And even in the early days, uh, earlier days when you were, you know, trying to become a quote unquote MAPS certified MDMA therapist, you'd go through their thorough training process, but uh, the cherry on top would be supervised experience. So actually guiding people through the MDMA journey and the opportunities to do that were relegated to clinical trials, which at the time I went through MAPS MDMA training, they were wrapping up phase three or in some kind of special access program or compassionate use program, which are pretty rare. Um, yeah. So one of the cool things, there's now a place in Colorado that's doing training therapists using psilocybin. So you get to go through your own psilocybin journey. And that's, that's new. I only heard about that recently. Um, yeah, we call that cool. ex- experiential training. And Reed and I have talked a lot about it. And there's plenty of like ketamine training retreats that will offer that. But, and it's it's a bit kind of debated. And I know we've we've mentioned this a couple of times in the show, Reed. And then we talked about it in the fundamentals course, if I remember right. But how important is it for a therapist or a sitter to have their own experience with altered states generally, or their own experience with the altered state that is specific to that medicine that you're using? Um, the, the short answer, at least for me is I think it's tremendously helpful. Um, I'm not too territorial. I think, uh, a really good therapist can still do really good work with somebody having not experienced an altered state. Um, but I think it's actually really, really important. And then also you want to be careful that you don't then project your ex- altered state experience onto that of your client, right? Don't assume just because you did mushrooms once in your experiential training and you, you, you talk to, you know, God or whatever, that uh, your client's having the exact same experience. Yeah. I mean, this is sort of choosing your lineage, right? Like I have, I feel most comfortable in the lineage that Numinous teaches, um, which is this sort of non-directed, finding your inner healer kind of thing. Um, because that just seems like it less can go wrong. It can get hairy less often than if you decide that your lineage is the Shipibo one, you're, you're going to sing dark energy out of people or, um, because those require more, more training and just a deeper, deeper knowledge of things. So, um, I think for people that are starting out, I think that the, the light touch I think is, is better. At least I see that around here where people who come in guns a blazing and I'm going to cure everyone's everything. Sometimes that stuff is just a not working and B it's a real bad vibe and it just doesn't, doesn't work. People get in over their skis as we, those of us in the mountain West say. And so it's funner to me. It's more interesting to, 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 to sit as an observer, um, at least at first. So, I appreciate that you guys are bringing this modality to more people and helping people to uh, get their feet wet with sitting. So I think you guys are doing a great thing. Well, thank you, Riley. And thank you for joining us on the podcast and for taking the fundamentals course and for the kind things that you said about it. Um, of course, it's a it's something that we are um, editing in real time each time we offer it, trying to improve based on feedback. So appreciate your feedback. Um, Anything else you want to talk about or say before we wrap up? Oh, I'm sure there is. Mm -hmm. Um, How about um, how can people get, um, what would you say to people is to the next thing that people can do? Let's say they don't want to be a a therapist. Um, 
Well, let's no. Let's just. Wh- why am I asking this? I'm asking for me. Should I take the uh, just embodied <laughs> approach? Think that's the next thing I should do. Well, I think you've probably already answered that question for you. You you have a deep okay. curiosity. Uh, the barrier to entry is low. Um, I would feed that curiosity. And, you know, we open our course to, to uh, a variety of folks, right? It's not just licensed practitioners. So um, we are in, in the business of increasing access to knowledge. So um, that's why this podcast has never been sponsored and always free, for example. Uh, I mean, sponsored by Numinous, who, you know, pays us, <laughs> but that's about it. So, yeah, I would I would follow your curiosity. That's my advice to you, Riley, and to everybody listening. Um, and more information is rarely a bad idea. Yep. Well, that sounds good. There's always, like I said, this is just a bottomless topic, and that's one of the great things about it. You can just never find the, the corners of it. There's always more on the mm-hmm. sides, and that's one of the really – really cool things and makes it a pursuit for a lifetime as I know you guys know. So thanks for having me on. And, uh, Steve, thanks for teaching me all that you taught me. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And thanks for the work you do, Riley, great writing and articles and what you put out there to, to uh, shine a light of awareness on important things is really, is really meaningful. So thank you. Thanks Reed. I appreciate it. It was good getting to know you and talking to you a little bit more. Likewise. Yeah, this has been fun. Yeah, thanks, guys. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous, a mental wellness company committed to tackling the global mental health crisis by delivering best-in-class psychedelic-assisted therapies, contributing to the body of primary and clinical psychedelic research, and fostering healing through community connection and social responsibility. You can learn more about Numinous at Numinous.com. That's N-U-M-I-N-U-S.com. If you enjoyed the show today and you want to support us, here's how you do it. Rate and review the show on platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Subscribe to the Numinous YouTube channel. Like the videos and share it. Share the show or clips of the show with someone that you think will enjoy it. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Consult with a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.